so nice to see everybody. If I didn't see you at orientation, my name is Victoria Howell. And in case you need to know, you're at the A. Richard Newton Distinguished Innovator Lecture Series, a Berkeley Changemaker course. Uh, after our orientation, it's our kickoff today. And lest you think, uh, as nice as it is to see everybody, that these are quick to put together, it really takes a village. Um, Sukriti and Artem are here helping with filming and uh, the coordinators for the course. Uh, Tim and Carolina are up above helping with lighting. And it's also my pleasure to introduce to you two fellow students who will introduce our speakers. Uh, next week, just as a reminder, we have the co-founders of Ruby uh, Labs coming to talk. And I'm not sure, but I think we might have an opening still for someone to introduce each of them. Uh, but in the meantime, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Sean Tooby. I don't know if you all already know Sean or not. He's a fourth year at Haas doing data science. He's had an incredible summer, which I feel kind of envious of, being in Israel and Barcelona. Uh, and he, he joins us here having already had a startup. So here's my trick question. How did the startup do? Oh, fantastic, about to partner with Skydeck. OK, that's fantastic. Here, the trick question is, so many startups fail, it's almost a rite of passage, but not, not so that's fantastic. Um, Arushi's going to be introducing Matt. Um, I should say that Sean will be introducing Mar. Uh, Arushi's actually only been in the States this time for four weeks. Uh, joins us focusing on business and, admin and entrepreneurship. Uh, she has, in case you don't feel like you're accomplished enough, it, like wait till you hear this. She's already published a book on social entrepreneurship and uh, tech. And I'll let you all take it away and introduce our speakers tonight who will be seated in the green chairs. Uh, we are gonna try to be videoing tonight, but we are not sure if it's gonna work. Just FYI, just to give you a, a warning on that. And if you are dying to know what the access code is, we'll be posting it the last 10 minutes of class. With that. Thank you. Hey guys, thank you for the nice intro, Professor Howell. Uh, so again, my name is Sean, senior here, and uh, very excited to introduce uh, one of today's speakers because she has actually unknowingly inspired me to both launch the startup I'm doing right now and pursue a career in venture capital. So it is my pleasure to introduce entrepreneur, venture capitalist, and professor, Mar Hershenson, right here on your left. Gr sure. <laughs> Growing up in Spain, Mar earned her bachelor's in electrical engineering in Madrid, although she is known to be an avid FC Barcelona fan. <laughs> And she then came to the United States and received her master's and PhD in uh, electrical engineering from Stanford uh, for her breakthrough work in circuit design automation. After graduating, she gained more than 13 years of founder experience. Uh, during this time, she launched three startups, Barcelona Design, Sabio Labs, and Revel Touch, throughout which she re registered 14 different patents. Now, Mar is the co-founder and managing partner at Pair VC, a leading seed stage investment firm in Menlo Park. And at Pair, Mar works closely with founders to build category-defining businesses and helps take them from zero to one. Pair has invested early in startups now worth over $100 billion across many verticals, including consumer, healthcare, healthcare fintech, uh, climate, and Web3. Pair's notable investments include two IPOs in DoorDash and Garden Health, and a series of other disruptive companies, including Gusto, Branch, and Juni Learning, which I'm sure some of us have actually used. Mar's numerous accolades are topped by her being consecutively named by the Forbes Midas list as one of the leading venture capital investors in the world, as well as, as, well as being in the top three for female investors. Mar has also been recognized by MIT Technology Review as a top innovator under 35, named a champion of innovation by Fast Company, 
and included by the EE Times in its listing in the top 10 women in microelectronics. Additionally, Mara currently lectures at Stanford, so we're fortunate to have her here today with us, uh, serves on the board of Harvey Mudd College, and is a technical advisor to the US Soccer Federation. So Mar, thank you so much for joining us today. And I believe I could speak for the whole class when I say we are very excited to learn more about your illustrious <laughs> career in venture capital. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, thank you. And I'll now pass it off to Arushi to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Sean, for that wonderful introduction. Hello, all. Uh, I am Arush Gupta. I'm an international exchange student from India, majoring in business. And I am super stoked to introduce you all to the second speaker of today. Along with Mar, we have indeed the best person to make today's event complete and <laughs> twice as amazing as it already is. Everyone, please welcome Matt Hershenson, who is equal parts engineering, entrepreneurship, and venture fund a notable name in the Silicon Valley for tremendous contribution to the hardware products across categories of integrated circuits, laptops, smartphones, and definitely someone with a career trajectory like nobody else, for which I personally respect him hugely. With that, he also happens to be Mars' other half. Matt is the co-founder and managing director at Playground Global, a venture fund and design studio providing resources, mentorship, and funding to startups excelling in hardware. Always enjoying the entrepreneurial spirit, his first experience in technology was as a teenager when he had an after-school job at Carnegie Mellon University's Robotics Institute, where he was deemed fit for running cables and labs and machine rooms. Since then, he just knew he was going to be an engineer when he moved to Silicon Valley to work at Apple after graduating from the University of Michigan studying physics, what he did not predict was the evolution of cell phone. But as we all know, him being known for co-founding Danger, yes, that same company that brought uh, T-Mobile Sidekick to life, there he was sitting on the cutting edge innovation of cellular technology. Leveraging his mobile hardware experience, he joined Google's Android team as the director of hardware where he built the Android hardware team to span all aspects of hardware development from chip design to regulatory compliance and basically everything in between. Matt and his team shipped over 10 generations of devices across phones, tablets, and streaming receivers. In the late 2014, he joined up with the founding team to start Playground with the idea of investing in transformative companies with multi-generational impact. Today, he still stands unafraid of technological risk. He believes that if you're going to go through the trouble, you might as well create something significant. And with this thought, let's now kick off today's event where every single person in this room dreams big, is ready to take risks, and create something meaningful and significant. So ladies and gentlemen, with a big round of applause, please welcome the power couple, Mar and Matt Hershenson. <laughs> Oh. Thank you for being here, and thank you for making the trek from Menlo Park. Uh, it's, it's great to have you on this side of the bay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having us. It's our us. pleasure to be here. Uh, so you have these incredible timelines up here, but I'm also wondering if, as, as, as we know, Mara and Matt, just in case you didn't get that, are married. I'm just curious, how long have you been married again? 26 years. Yes, sir. Who's One count? month, seven days, I don't know, something <laughs> like that. We were married in um, uh, August of 1996. Oh, fantastic. And at that point in 1996, when I'm looking at it, it looks like maybe were you working at Apple? No, I, um, at the time, was working for Philips. For uh, Philips, yeah. Philips Consumer Electronics. I subsequently worked for Philips Semiconductor, but I worked for uh, Philips Consumer Electronics at the time. And Mar, what were you doing? I was a student living off my husband's. <laughs> there, was a, there was a generous stipend involved. Stipend, no. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was a student. And Matt was a student, I guess, through me. I think uh, very few people know. Um, I, my research at Stanford was on using a special type of optimization to design analog circuits. And 
in preparing for your PhD defense, I had to, I don't even have to, but I said, I'm going to put a software demo together. But uh, being a very, you know, I would say, hardcore engineer, I'm like, I don't know how to design these GUIs on this front end. So Matt said, well, I'll do it for you. So he actually got half a PhD and put the front end together for what of ended course. up she, she's being, being my thesis. Mara's being very generous. But I wrote, yeah, just a graphical front end to a piece of MATLAB code that was running the core algorithms that she invented uh, during her PhD Yeah, dissertation. but the GUIs are really important. I mean, they need to look good. You need those front end <laughs> skills, everybody, yeah. Um, and, but yeah, I was working at the time, but the job wasn't super demanding. So as Mar said, I would you know, work and then we would usually uh, go to dinner or something like that and she would return to the lab and then I would just, I would be there as well. So I sort of had uh, a lot of exposure to graduate school both vicariously, but also in the evenings, I was, you know, uh, at the, what was it, um, the Center for Integrated Systems at, at Stanford as well. At Stanford, yeah. yeah, fantastic. Well, since you're talking already and we have this up here, um, I'm just wondering, you know, most of us, not all of us, but most of us are, are still in the middle of their undergrad and some of you in your graduate degree. Uh, I'm wondering if you could kind of take us back to those days when you graduated from Michigan, whoop, whoop. Um, and, and, you know, how you came out to the valley and what you found a little bit, uh, kind of a little bit of your journey along yeah. the way. So, so the record should show, uh -huh. uh, I did study at Michigan, but there was a job waiting and there were a few credits short, so I, I, I left. So I, I'm non-degreed. Um, it's important to be precise about these things. Um, but, you know, I was studying physics and there was part of me that thought about graduate school, but I had worked a summer um, in 1988 for Apple and there was a returning job offer, and when I told them I'm going to need a little bit more time to actually get that degree, they said, come on down. So I, I left and started working for Apple in um, August of 1989. Wow. Um, and that was back in a time, sort of a different era in a number of ways, of course, but, you know, Apple's a computer company. I mean, they're uh, of course, they still make computers, but they're a phone company sort of first and foremost now. Um, and they were also manufacturing, uh, not all, but most of the computers sold in the United States were manufactured in Fremont, California, just down 880 from here. And so I took a job working as um, an engineer in manufacturing research and development. So sort of advanced assembly technologies and techniques that they were developing uh, for the for the future of manufacturing um, that they were doing then in in that Fremont facility. What was it about Apple that was intriguing? I mean, it wasn't as quite as ubiquitous as it is now. So I, I think that what was true of Apple then um, that the there was such a passion that was reflected in the products they put out and the level of polish in the software and and the hardware as well. Um, and it was a really exciting time just in terms of how the personal computer penetration was increasing um, and, again, manufacturing was something that I was drawn to because the things which I like are sort of mechanical and electrical. And so working in, in um, you know, a high-tech factory had a lot of appeal and around robotics and automation. It was really rudimentary at that point in time. But it was a really exciting you know, time and, and, and place uh, in technology. Often when you're starting out and you're right after school, out of school and sometimes you don't have other things that you're responsible for, you spend a lot of time at work and you make a lot of interesting relationships. Uh, any relationships that you'd made during that time that were influential? Well, I was, I was brought into the company by somebody who was and, and still is a close friend. Um, and... In terms of, I, I had this question I haven't thought about in a long time, like who's, whom was I working with back then and, and how much am I in touch with them now and what other sorts of things have they gone on to do? I think that, you know, I was recently listening to a podcast about sort of um, the dawn of the semiconductor industry and, you know, Fairchild and, and Shockley and the Trader Estate and that sort of a thing. I mean, there's a lot of histories of the Silicon Valley to read. And it's actually interesting because Mar at one point in time worked for... Um, Linear Technology Corporation, uh, which was a descendant. So there was Shockley, and there was Fairchild, and National Semiconductor, and Linear Technology Corporation was actually, you know, there's all this d descendants from some of these things. I think that Apple at that time, they weren't 
there weren't a lot of companies that sort of were, were spun out of it. Mm -hmm. um, so interesting people and doing a lot of fascinating things. And I learned just a tremendous amount and, and you know, built some friendships that, I, as I said, sort of endured to this day. Um, but I think the entrepreneurial spirit of the Valley wasn't quite as much in swing as it is, say, now. Yeah. Why? Uh, so, and you left. Sorry? And you left. And I left. I left. I, I mean, it was kind of a, a turn in the road that Apple actually started, you know, making, I think it's been a complete transition by now, but sort of a move to a little bit more outsourced manufacturing. I was actually laid off from Apple, which turned out, you know, sort of when, when one door closes, another door opens up. And so I think that that sort of was, propelled me into a more entrepreneurial career that I started an engineering consultancy with a friend from Apple who also was laid off and another engineer whom he knew. Um, but yeah, I, I guess that sort of got it kick-started in a way. Yeah, and can you talk a little bit about the, uh, about danger? I don't know if you're, actually, I don't think you're talking about danger with the consultancy. No, so the danger was many years later. So um, danger, we started in December of 1999. Um, when things looked rosy for a little while then, but at any rate, it was the combination of a couple of technical changes that we saw coming about that led us to, to start the company. And um, web portals, so Yahoo and um, you know, Excite and, and other web properties were surging in market value and, and popularity. And so we thought there should be some physical instantiation of that so you, when, you're, when you're not in front of your computer, that you can still interact with these with these properties. And I, I don't know the numbers, but cell phone penetration wasn't particularly high. Um, but, you know, so it wasn't like everybody had uh, a, a mobile web browser. They didn't have a mobile device, most people, at that point. So it was a series, and we went through a series of pivots before we sort of ar arrived at what effectively one would consider kind of a smartphone. But, you know, we, we wound up at that place where we decided the, the web had gone mainstream. I mean, my, you know, my mother had an email account, right? I mean, it was, and she ran a web browser on her, on her home computer. And so we thought, just as cell phones were compelling because you, know, you didn't have to be tied to your, your desk to get a phone call, freeing the web up from a desktop experience would be incredibly compelling. And, you know, so that was kind of the, the thesis of it. And then it was enabled by a lot of the technologies that you see today, of course, in smartphones and batteries and the state of microprocessors at that point in time and screens and so on and so forth. But another thing that was really, really key was that the mobile networks were going from um, circuit switch calls, circuit switch data, to packet switch data. And so basically what it meant is it, it was a point in time where in order to, you could, you have a, this is a long time ago, but if you wanted to, you know, be at home and, and, and use uh, a computer service, you would you take your phone and you would plug it into an a, a acoustically coupled modem and you would make a phone call to, to, you know, CompuServe or something like that. But while you were on the phone, nobody else could be using the phone at home. And the same was true initially of cellular data. You, you had to grab a circuit and you use that to send and receive data. When the digital networks came about, um, it changed so that you could then, the voice was sent digitally, but that same digital um, encoding and that same digital bandwidth could be used, but very sparingly, to make a data connection. So what it meant, though, is that flat rate pricing could be done for data. And so that was a really, really key enabler, because one of the things that was incredible about the sidekick was that it was flat rate data. And that really, really unlocked it. And you know, credit to T-Mobile for offering that as a billing plan. Um, and then there was just a lot of really smart and dedicated people at Danger who you know, designed the hardware, built the hardware, wrote all the software. We had a back-end service. Um, it, was, it was a really exciting time sort of to, to build what became a mass market device. Wow. Um, I'm, I'm hesitant, to, I'm, there's so much more to talk about, but I'm kind of trying to get Mar to catch up now, catch yes, us God. up while it's all this so much is going on. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, you know, after you got your PhD, after your GUI was all uh, done, uh, what was well, happening Well, maybe I'll talk you? for the, I don't know how many folks in the audience are considering going to grad school and yeah. academia, et cetera, but um, 
you know, I was, I, I thought I was going to be a professor for many, many years. My dad is a professor. Um, I, you know, he was very accomplished engineer. I was just a, you know, an academic. Um, I even went and interviewed to be a professor. And this was 1999, which was a crazy time here in the Bay. I mean, it was crazy. Everything was getting funded. You just need to put .com after any name. And, <laughs> uh, you know, you would raise money and you would go public in a year. That's the way that things were going here. Um, so, you know, when I was defending, when I getting ready to defend my thesis, uh, somebody said, oh, you should just take your software and put it on the web and start a company. Uh, and I said, wow, it took me a long time to kind of, uh, you know, decide to do that. It's a big change, right? Um, and I think at the last minute, you know, I was about to sign an offer uh, to be a professor. Um, I think Matt was like, I don't want to move anywhere. <laughs> so, you, so I, you know, I decided, okay, I'll start this company. So, you know, that's how I got into the business of starting companies almost by accident. Um, left behind all my academia and decided to do this. So, anyways. So, um, Sean is Haas at Haas. A lot of uh, people in the audience are from Haas. Neither one of you had a business background, it seems like, no. unless I'm missing something. How did that work for you all as you're both basically starting companies? Well, I'll tell you a funny story because we were absolutely clueless and there was no internet. So, you know, today if you go to the internet and type, how to raise money for my company, there's like a million hits, you know? I mean, maybe 80% of them are wrong, but there's a lot of hits. At the time, there was nothing. So my, um, my advisor, Stephen Boyd, and I, we, we were like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And Stephen said, oh my gosh, let's go to the bookstore. Let's buy a book. I'm like, <laughs> totally, let's go buy a book. So we went to the Stanford bookstore, and they're like, oh, we have a book for you. I'm like, great. So they gave us this book, and it's uh, How to Start a Business by IEEE. So <laughs> <laughs> that was our education, you know, which, you know, I think we learned a lot on the job, I would say. What about you, Matt? So I think, and I think it still remains true, is that if, if you have an idea for a product that you think would be compelling to you and a lot of people like you, I mean, so again, like a, a mass market, a consumer device, we really felt the internet's really useful. We wish we could use it everywhere. I mean, it started with a core belief of the utility of what we were doing and that it would be broadly popular. So um, I think that at the heart of every great business is something like that. Where Now, what, what I do at Playground is we invest primarily in, in deep technology, but it still is this, does it go after a problem that's really worth solving that a lot of, you know, if you're B2B, and most of our companies tend to be, that a lot of businesses would have, you know, that you're going after something of scale. Um, but I think that in terms of that activation energy to start a company, you have to have conviction more than anything else. And like, this is a problem worth solving. Um, you know, we obviously, we brought on business people and in terms of the, the machinations around contact negotiation and that sort of stuff, it's, it's super helpful to have. But you know, at the core of the belief is how compelling the solution could be. And with regards to Mars software, I, I think that there were just early signs that the ability to automatically design circuits was something that, yeah, there are a lot of circuit, there are not enough circuit designers out there. They don't have, there's more work than they can get done. So if you find something that could effectively boost their productivity, it was just a, it was a really compelling uh, technology and product and company. But, but I think you bring a really important point. Like, I was not a business person, um, and it took, you know, several jobs, I think. I'm still learning, I would say. But one of the reasons we started Pair, uh, you know, it was written on that conviction that we could help students start companies. And I actually believe everybody in this audience, you're at Berkeley, it's an amazing institution. You can be a great CEO, or you can be a great investor, right? And I think the what goes from being a student to being successful or whatever is, um, you know, a lot of learning, right? So it's if you're ready to learn and you surround yourself by the right people, I think it's possible. And that's, you know, one of the things that motivate us to do pair, I think, 50%, over 50% of our companies are student funded, are founded, so which is, you know, kind of crazy, but, you know, you're getting pretty good at it. One of our themes this semester, not just, you know, partners in innovation, is a little bit about conflict and the conflict's role in creativity. Um, 
I have a quote here, but I won't even bother reading it, but I just am wondering, as you're starting your company and you're working on danger, which in both cases were quite a while ago, um, and we'll talk about what you're doing now in a, in a moment, but anything that comes to mind where uh, conflict was crucial and how you had to get past it and how you did go past it or didn't? Well, in, in terms of conflict, so, what we wound up doing is, isn't that, you know, we, we didn't ship the first idea we had. And so we had this notion about doing, you know, kind of a different product, something really, really scaled down. It wasn't, wasn't wireless. Um, and so the process of going, you know, through a, a pivot, as it's, as it's called, I don't think it was a term that people used back then, but, you, you know, you have an idea and it was compelling enough for you to start a company and then you have to decide, like, wait a second, like, this is not going to, this isn't good enough. You know, there's, there's inevitably a conflict there. Um, and so I think that it's really important in the context of companies. And you know, as what we do as venture capitalists, I think we're a thought partner in this, is to really question the ideas you have and is something worth building and you know, how big can it be and that kind of a thing. So it, I don't think it's contentious, but there is this conflict of, you know, is this idea good enough? Like, does it, does it, does it clear the bar? And so I, I think that having that as part of how you can work with co-founders and you know, honestly how you can work with investors, whether they've written a check to you or not, here's what I want to do and um, you know, be able to take you know, critique and criticism and, and, and questions about it. I think that that's a really important part of the entrepreneurial process. Any tips on taking critiques and criticism? It's not always easy. Well, I think that one has to ask like, what's your goal? And if your goal is to build a great company, and somebody can tell you ways in which it might not be a great company, and you can watch out for that, they're doing you a favor. Um, so I think that that's just how you have to look at it, right? As opposed to, um, you know, I mean, your competitors may say things about you, and they you know, may or may not be true, that kind of a thing. But if you have the singular goal and you're focused on, I want to make the best thing possible, here's what I was thinking of doing, what do you think? You know, taking that input, I think, is always... Um, you know, a unique opportunity. And in the course of what we do, and, you know, in, in venture capital, if we tell somebody, like, we don't think this is an investment for us, we really want to try to be pretty transparent and tell them, here's why not, because, you know, uh, I am, and I, I know Mar is a like, huge fan of entrepreneurship, and it's just such a leap of faith, and I have tremendous respect and admiration for anybody who's prepared to do that. And so even if I think that it's not a fit for Playground to invest, you know, I, I, I wish an entrepreneur well on their, on their entrepreneurial journey, and here's what I thought of, you know, this is why we don't think that it's a fit, but, you know, take this input as you would wish, and maybe you can, you know, you're committed to building your company, it might be useful for you to know uh, how we arrived at this decision, and, you know, sort of good luck to you. That, that, that's very much how we Seems approach like it. Seems like that's a best practice for individuals to watch out for, that that's an expectation you should have after you pitch a company, that you get that kind of feedback. I, I saw you laughing a little bit earlier. So I was wondering if you had a particular story to share. Well, no, I'm not, I have to say I love conflict. So, you know, I, maybe it's my Mediterranean background, but I'm very passionate and I appreciate, I think, you know, I have my uh, business partner, Peshman at Pear. We will argue all the time. And I think when somebody comes to Pear for the first time, they're like, oh my gosh, this guy is like, they, how do they get along? But it's just, you know, we respect each other. If there's respect and trust, you can have conflict. And that's okay, you know, and I think conflict is actually really good. It's what makes, it's what moves things, you know. If you, if you don't have to work for anything, if there is no friction, you make no movement, right? Uh, I like teams that you have people from diverse backgrounds that don't always agree and align because we create better products, right? But um, in order to survive conflict, respect and trust are the number, you know, the most important ingredients. So... Um, I would say the other question you had about how do you, you know, how do you take criticism? It's so hard. It's so hard to take criticism. You know, I remember my, uh, my first company hearing negative feedback and just, I was just overwhelmed. It was just terrible, right? And, um, and now I'm like, okay, negative feedback. This is my opportunity to do better. And I, my advice would be just own it. If somebody says something negative, it's either a data point that in your learning journey or just, okay, maybe I made a mistake. You say, I made a mistake. Uh, this is what I'm going to do to fix it. This is how I'm going to solve it. It's very empowering. That's probably the uh, 
most important personal growth that I had in the last 20 years, just being okay with hearing something negative. It, it's hard. I mean, you know, we so all hard. have feelings. However, it's worse to hear nothing. Uh, you know, it's like being ghosted almost. Well, very much so. At the end of the day, the market's going to judge what you do. And so, you're, you know, a decision will be rendered. And by the way, we are wrong all the time. Yes. You know, it's not like we're right, all, you know, always. Um, I, I, it's actually, you know, very important. When I first started at Pair, I would used to send email. You know, I had a lot of free time. So I used to send emails to people and we would pass and said, hey, if you want to talk on the phone, I'm happy to tell you how I arrived at this um, decision. And I thought everybody's going to call me. And actually, not many people took me up on that, which I was very hurt, but you know, that's okay now. <laughs> Can you take us back to like how, I think you started as Pejman Mar. I mean, yes. how that even came about that all of a sudden you're like, we're going to start to invest in other companies now. Well, my business partner, Pejman, had been an angel investor for many, many years. And I think Matt said, I'll tell you the story because I think it's really interesting. He, um, Matt, my, my business partner started as a, uh, rug salesman in, uh, yeah, in Pal you know, Palo Alto. If you've been to University Avenue, there's a big store, and he was the salesman there. And he got into the business of investing because he saw everybody that was buying rugs. They were very expensive. They were either investors or, uh, or CEOs or founders. Anyways, Matt, when they were uh, raising money for Danger, it was 1999, so I think you quit in August or something. I forget, but I said, wow. They're gonna, they thought I raised money in a week. So easy, because the money was just raining. It was crazy. Um, and I think four months later, five months later, no money. You know, there was no, nobody gave them money. Which, by the way, talks about venture capital, right? Everybody wanted to fund dot coms and not phones. Because who would have a mobile phone? I mean, it's crazy, but the world, they didn't imagine that everybody would actually have a smartphone in their pocket. So... Um, I think one day Matt came home. I said, oh, my gosh, somebody gave us money. I'm like, who gave you money? He's like, this guy in a rug store. I said, oh, my God, return that money. You know, <laughs> it cannot be real. <laughs> so that's how I met Peshman. Uh, when I started my second company, we went to pitch to Peshman. And uh, in 2009, he said, he came to me and said, Mar, I'm going to start a fund. I'm going to have a big house. So just for the, for the record. We both returned money to him. Yeah, we both <laughs> made him money. <laughs> Two uh, good investments. But he said, I'm going to have a house. I'm going to fill it up with students. And I'm going to serve them Persian tea. And we'll just invest in the best ones. So why don't you join me? I need a partner. And I said, oh, my God, this man is crazy. Uh, I've never invested. Uh, I mean, he is very magnetic. He is very, well, he did not give up. It took him four years to convince me to do it. And then... At the end, you know, he started with a crazy idea. So at the end, he changed strategies and said, well, let's just uh, meet at Coupa Cafe. We'll just meet some founders. Maybe we'll do angel investing together. And, it, you know, initially I was there an hour a week. And um, three months into it, I was there from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. meeting founders. And I said, okay, man, you win. How did you get founders to, how did you schedule that? How did you find the founders? Well, Peshman knew a bunch of people. And then if you are in a coffee shop, you make friends, right? So people knew we were there. People would show up. We didn't even have a t-shirt or a fund, but, um, you know, we would hang out there and talk to founders. How? One after another. It was, it was a good, good times. And, and, uh, and by the way, and the way we started, I was telling Matt, I used to spend a lot of time in Berkeley. So um, we wanted to back students. So we said, okay, we'll just go to Stanford and Berkeley. So we showed up at Stanford and said, hi, we're a venture fund. And I think they looked at us like, who are these two people? Um, and then we came to Berkeley and we did the same thing. Hi, we are a venture fund and we're here to fund students. And, you know, that's how we got started. You just have to go for it. Um, I had not heard of any of the VCs coming and actually offering money. But yes. you all offered a prize. If we I did. Recall. We were like, we just got to go. <laughs> and that was as Petra Mar or Pear Petra Ventures? Mar. And how did you all shift to Pear Ventures? Uh, well, we paid somebody a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we tried to change the name for a long time, and we even had a contest. No student was able to come up with a name. <laughs> So we finally hired a you know, branding agency. She was very inexpensive because we didn't have any money, but 
Um, she said, oh, Pej Mama are always together. They pair with people, P-A-I-R. And then she's, Pej Mama wanted a fruit, so they said pear, and then so it happens that... Because they didn't want apple? No. <laughs> you know, Pej Mama, uh, Pej Mama is P-E, and I'm A-R, so it just kind of works together. So anyways, it's a, many reasons it's a good name. And what are you all, you've invested in some incredible companies, including DoorDash, mm -hmm. uh, who's at Calgrad. How did you, how do you find some of your, your top ones? What do you look for? Honestly, it's, um, I think I was just talking to Sean at the beginning. It's so hard to, you know, at the beginning when we invest at zero, sometimes I say there's no product, there are no customers. I say sometimes we invest at minus one because we know it's the wrong idea, but it's the right person and we're going to help them figure it out. So we invest super, super early and, um, you know, we are the opposite from a traditional investor, which would look at a spreadsheet or would do a ton of market analysis and try to predict what the future is like, et cetera. Um, we are very people focused and we are more company builders, you know, than, than investors at the end of the day. I tell people I'm a whiteboard VC, I need a whiteboard because I have to iterate with that company on what we're going to build. Um, yeah, so it's a lot of people reading. Do you do anything to have people uh, better work with each other also in the company? You know, when we invest, it's typically so small. There's either one person, one founder. Many times it's a one founder or two. So, um, and yeah, we will try to give them our best practices, but we're not there when the company's 20 or 50 people. Right. That's not my job. You know, my job is to help them, you know, get to product market fit. And that you should do with a small team. And, you know, if the team doesn't get along, there's so little that the fa investor can do. There's so little. Um, it's the worst. You know, I think we can fix almost anything. My job, there's problems every day. Every day things don't work. People can hire somebody, some customer, quit, you know, didn't sign something. Uh, there was a, an outage. The product failed. Everything is a problem. Uh, but I can... When there's a problem, I'm like, okay, I've seen this 50 times. We're going to go fix it. Um, I can't really fix teams that easily. Do teams come to you and tell you if there's a problem? Not with them working together, but you just said, you know, give me this. I can fix this. Do they come and tell you or do you notice it? You notice it, but they do sometimes. They come, when they come to you, it's too late. <laughs> so you have to be very good at figuring out yeah. ahead of time. So, and, and, you know, and... And you, you know, I've been doing this for 10 years, and we see companies all the time. I remember my first month at the job, you know, we would have two people come. I remember vividly this. We had this person come, and he was a CTO of a few startups. And I forget, but he had worked at Google or Apple. I don't know. It was an amazing resume. And he was starting some company. And I, Peshman and I were talking to him, and I said, oh, my gosh, Peshman, we should back in. It's amazing. And Peshman said, he hasn't said a single positive thing. We cannot back this person. And, you know, there's every, you know, I've had a lot of these meetings. So after a while, you know, just the way somebody presents and talks in a 30-minute meeting gives you an insight of how are they going to react when there is a problem, how are they going to treat their people. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a people-reading business. During this time, you have, you're, you're working all out also. How were you involved initially in anything other than purchasing the, the, the rug? Or did you purchase the rug? <laughs> I, I wasn't the rug customer. Your partner purchased right. the rug. Yeah, yeah, it was a co-founder who did, but yeah. <laughs> what, what were you thinking and watching in this? And, 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 uh, in terms of, sorry, uh, how we were building Danger at the time or as Pear got launched? As, as Pear Mar got launched and as you're building danger and going over to Google as yeah. well. Yeah, so well, one of the things that I think is really important, and it's interesting to consider sort of when we were most entrepreneurial in, in our own careers, and then to sort of reflect upon that for your, yourselves. Um, you know, when we were first married and we had no kids, that kind of a thing, um, you know, I think we, we felt like we had a lot of capacity for risk. And one of the things that I would certainly encourage undergraduates and, you know, graduate students, whatever to think of, if you can maintain your current lifestyle and think like, well, to live like a student or slightly better, here's what I need to earn, you're in the perfect place to be at a startup. And I think everybody, I mean, you're, at, you're at in the, the, you know, the best place in the world to, to be at a startup. And so, you know, when we were married and sort of just starting out, we thought like, why not take, a, you know, additional risk? And like, sure, let's, let's uh, you know, 
when I had started Danger and then Mar very shortly thereafter started Barcelona Design, we had a really high capacity for risk. So we were very fortunate in that regard. And so I encourage everybody who's in a position to do it, to you know, start a company or, or go to work at a startup, that kind of a thing. After Mar had sold um, Sabio Lab, so it was this, this company that was sort of the second company based on her, her, her graduate research. And um, she had sold it to a, a, a large public um, EDA company, so she had a successful exit. We had sold uh, Danger to Microsoft, which was also a successful exit. So, you know, at that point, we had saved a, a, a little bit, um, you know, from those things. And so I think we, again, sort of had a high capacity for, for taking a risk. Mm -hmm. And it was really clear. I, I, of course, had known Pejman because he was an investor in Danger. Just the, you know, when, when Mar talks about it's a, it's a people business, I think being in venture, it's also a people business. And so the, the passion that, that Pejman had for starting uh, a venture firm and, you know, Mar's incredible technical abilities and, and also, you know, her, her drive to do that, um, you know, I admired that, right? And so, you know, completely supportive of that, uh, of, of that endeavor. Um, and, you know, as, and then we started um, Playground, you know, not that long after as well. Um, and so I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a leap of faith, but one that I'm really glad that she took, one that I'm really glad that, but, you know, multiple points in her career and one that I'm glad that I took again, you know, sort of at multiple points. How do you, do you have similar, uh, similarities in how you look at investment teams? Do you look at the team or what you're doing is so, a lot about the idea. So Playground, hardware. we're, well, initially we were focused on, on hardware. We since have sort of pivoted, I guess, but we're very focused on deep technology. I mean, we're sort of early stage deep technology um, uh, firm. We're, we're not quite as early. We're not at minus one, I would say. We're a little bit more at zero to one. But when, when we look at companies, the core question that we're asking is, is there some you know, scientific engineering or medical breakthrough that's at the heart of this company that really puts them in a unique position to build, you know, as I said, sort of like multi-generational impact in a company by solving a problem, you know, using, using deep technology. We care about the team. I mean, the things that Mar said are, are essential. I mean, you need to find people who are passionate and work uh, well together, but who um, are really, really driven to create something that had never been before um, in, in their, you know, in, in the world. So we're a little bit slightly different in, in focus, but I think that, you know, entrepreneurship and in investing in entrepreneurs, it's all sort of, um, you know, you're looking at different facets of sort of the same sorts of gemstones. Um, and so, yeah, I think that we have, we, we're not often looking at the same companies, but it's a, a similar perspective on, you know, imagine a future where this company would exist. How big could it be? So, so maybe a very rudimentary question, but what's the difference between tech and deep tech? Well, so I think that all companies to, in, in the Valley, more often than not, have some technology in them. Yep. But we're looking for things that are singularly defined by the technology, and the, the, the technology itself is usually the differentiating feature. So, for instance, if you take a look at a company that, say, is doing um, uh, you know, fusion, yep. I mean, you have to build power plant, blah, 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 but, like, okay, what's the technique around fusion, that sort of a thing? We've invested in, for instance, a quantum computing company that's using uh, silicon photonics um, to, mm. to build the quantum computer. So again, that, that's a very particular technical direction that defines their company. A lot to build around it, but that sort of a thing. We have companies in life sciences that have uh, you know, synthetic biology techniques to enhance uh, a variety of therapeutics and that kind of a thing. So be that you know, programmable mRNA or a particular technology of protein design. So they, they tend to be pretty deep, so it's sort of like PhD level, yeah. not everybody has a PhD, but PhD level sort of technology research or something akin to that yeah. that's really at the core of the company. When you were talking about coming out with a phone, yep. you are talking about things that were happening in the market that just made there be an opportunity. And the way you talked about it was like, well, it was obvious that there was an opportunity. Maybe it wasn't obvious to anybody else, but I'm wondering if there are things that you see, patterns that you see today where you feel like there is an opportunity. Well, so um, we've invested in a lot of companies that have identified those kinds of things. Yeah. But I, I think that 
if you take a look, and, and you, know, you talked about the theme of conflict, it's really interesting how, you know, in, from, from a global standpoint, there's kind of an energy crunch that's been exacerbated by the, you know, the, the war in Ukraine that makes people think, you know, the dependence on natural gas is you know, not a good thing. I mean, it, it looks like it, it could be quite bad in Europe this winter. Um, and so there's been a re-examination around nuclear power. And so I, I think fusion is sort of, um, is on the upswing now, but I think it's gonna get increased uh, focus and attention. And so that's the sort of thing, you know, it's kind of a unique set of circumstances that I think the opportunity has always been there because energy is just a great industry, but that I think that people are looking more closely at, okay, we, sh we should really do something now and, and, and that kind of a thing around energy. You, I'm not sure that it's gonna be quite as frothy as the dot-com boom was, but I think that you know, fusion and fusion investments are something which are, are on the upswing because of it. And so, I mean, that, that's kind of a, a, a bigger trend. I, I think that what we saw was based on a, a series of things that were a little bit lower level than, than you know, what I talk about with sort of you know, global politics and, 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 and global conflict. But that's the power of an entrepreneur to a certain extent is that, I mean, they recognize a set of things and they kind of, you know, line up the points and then show, okay, because of this and this and this and what I've discovered and what I'm passionate about, here's what we can build. Yeah. And, you know, that we, we delight in hearing those stories. Um, you also have uh, budding adults, if not already adults. They'll uh, tell you they're adults. Yeah. <laughs> three, three children. Yes. Uh, so far. Um, you never know. Uh, or maybe you do. Um, but... You know, we have a, a, an audience here. I'm just wondering, like, what, what advice do you give to them? What would you give to all of those in the audience as they're starting out and continuing their journey in the world, regardless of whether they become entrepreneurs or not? I'm so happy you asked me this question because my children do not want to hear my <laughs> advice. <laughs> I'll be like, I have a long line Oops. of people that want my advice, but you don't. Um, yeah, but there are three people who <laughs> never in that line. Never in that line. <laughs> <laughs> um, most important. I would say, you know, we, you know, I think you have to invest in yourself. It's not over after school. You really have to constantly be learning. And there's different kind of learning. You know, one is like you can go read a book, but talking to people is so easy today to talk to anybody or access anybody online. And if you reach out to 100 people, a couple will reach out back to you at least, right? Depends on the message you write. So um, it's just really, it's the easiest it's ever been to get knowledge, right? And it doesn't end. At every point in our, in my career, you have to be constantly improving yourself. So I would say, uh, just make sure you invest in yourself, not just, uh, you know, companies like I do, anything. Um, I, I also like telling um, a story, you know, we, who, what are the founders that are most successful? I think they just really, um, you know, they really want it bad, right? They just, they can't stop working on something. They have this something in them that they have to show. Um, I like a story about, I don't know who likes basketball, but in 2016, the Warriors played the Cavs, and they went into the seventh game of the NBA, and it was, it was played here. It was expected that the Warriors would win. I mean, it was just everybody was like, of course they're going to win. People had parties at their homes here in the Bay Area because we were going to win, and um, actually the Cavs won. And you know, when you know, this uh, a friend of ours had asked him, what do you think, what happened? And he's like, well, LeBron James has wanted it more, right? And I think you have to want it more if you want to do great. Uh, it's not an accident that people do great. They just want it more. Uh, so I think that's really important. I have many more lessons, but I let Matt, you know. Yeah, well, otherwise, I look like an old lady. <laughs> <laughs> so I totally agree with what Mar said. I mean, this kind of like, tenacity and drive. And it's sort of interesting in, in, in startups, I mean, sports as well. Sometimes it's not just that you want to win, but that you refuse to lose. Um, and you see that in companies, and you also see it in people that, you know, they're, they have this drive um, and they have this vision of what they can do, and they'll, they just as a, as a force of will, they'll, they'll make it happen. And so I think that it's really important to decide, 
you know, that you dedicate yourself to things. And um, I mean, that when you, when you pick a goal, and it doesn't have to be, I'm going to build the next, you know, Uber or Google or whatever. Like, even if it's working at a class or, you know, acquiring a skill or that sort of a thing, that you engage in this practice of, you know, as Mars said, of learning, but, you know, sort of just relentlessness towards pursuing goals. Um, I think another thing that's also really important, uh, and I, I guess I actually haven't asked Mars this question, but where we... The companies that we invest in, most of the time, they're multiple founder companies. And certainly, the companies that succeed, I mean, you have to grow and scale. And so, you know, you're, you're building a company and you're working with people. Being good at working with people, and you know, as you talked about at Conflict, you know, getting along doesn't mean that you never argue. Getting along means that you can argue, you know, with principles. Um, and so I think that, you know, being able to disagree without being disagreeable um, and understanding how to... You know, listen to feedback and, and, and uh, to get stronger through it, I think that's also really, really important and something to practice and, and get good at. And, I, and listen to your parents. Yes. I have to say the only <laughs> advice that I've given my child that he actually listened. I think it's actually really important, everybody in this room, if you can do something before you leave today and talk to everybody in your row and connect somehow, I guess people will exchange Instagrams or Snapchats today, I don't know. Um, that's a value. You've done something great today, right? Um, my son had an internship this summer, and I said, listen, I don't, it doesn't matter what you do, but make sure you take everybody out to lunch so you get to know everybody that you've worked with. And, you know, it's a couple of months, so you get a lot of lunches to go and meet people. And at the end of the day, if you leave your internship or, you know, a class or whatever by making friends with 10 new people, 20 new people, it's just going to help you, you know, when you are ready to do anything, um, that's who actually makes things happen, other people, uh, so it's really important, and, and I really, you know, I think my, uh, Peshma as well, but I, we, Matt as well, we all, it's like we really care about people, it's a very human job, so, and at the end, companies work because of people, so it's, it's really important. If I went back to school, I would study psychology. I would make more friends. That's what I would do. It's not a, about the classes or anything. Well, you have the potential to make like 400 friends I am here like now. <laughs> uh, I'm hoping that we can kind of shift over the, the Q&A portion. And I just ask, as you all have questions, I hope you've gotten to know Matt and Mar just a little bit uh, during our, our last uh, 40 minutes. Um, but just uh, give us a little bit of background on yourself, uh, what you're studying, and uh, ask your question. And I think Sukriti, or I don't know who, is. we have two microphones going around the room. And we just ask you to use those microphones as you're asking questions. And there we go. All right. Do you want to get it, Sean? You get it. Hey, thank you both so much for coming and speaking to us. I found it really interesting that you brought up studying psychology. That's actually what I study. I love and that. Oftentimes in spaces like this, though, saying that feels very out of place because it's a lot of Haas people, it's a lot of engineering background people business people, and I'm wondering if you've seen successful founders from a background that is sort of unexpected who's pivoted into a field. Like, I work in neurotechnology. It's a little bit of a pivot from what you think of when you think of that field. Have you seen someone who is maybe an artist who then worked on a tech project that was very successful? Yeah. Any pivots like that you could talk about and how you would do that successfully? Yes, actually, very early on at Pear, we had... Um, you know, we had one of in the house that we had, and we had students. We had this French guy uh, who was a computer science student, but he really was an artist. He truly was an artist deep in himself. That's what he wanted to do. And, um, you know, he completely, you know, after spending, I think, five years at Stanford getting his CS degree, he decided, well, I truly want to be an artist. So he actually let it go and started building, you know, painting these murals, we actually, we, have a, we had one of those murals in our home, in our office in Palo Alto. I think we were his guinea pigs, the first, the first wall, somebody that gave him a wall, and I think he's doing great now, and that's what he does. He told me at the beginning he would like uh, do software contracting for people to support his artist's job. Um, 
But anyways, yeah, people change, and actually, it's not just at one point in time. You know, you are, you, it's so important to, you know, the best founders, they're very uh, knowledge rich. You know, they are, they have two brains, and then they're able to kind of share ideas between <clears throat> the two brains. So it's, it's, it's not enough, even in my grad school, it's in grad group, the people that were incredible scientists, they're not perhaps the most successful career people, right? And it's because it takes more. It's not enough to just be an engineer, right? Yeah. It's not enough. You have to be more. You have to be a person. Uh, the same way that when you ship a product, it's not enough to have the best technology. The product has to be the best, how it interacts with the rest of humanity, right? So it's, um, yeah, it's something I didn't appreciate when I was a student. So, you know, anyways, yeah, I have to go back to school. Another thing that I would say is that there are very, very important non-technical roles at, at startups that we work with. And so, for instance, and at our firms as well, so recruiting, mm -hmm. one of the things that actually both our firms do is we have recruiters at the firm who help young startups hire additional engineers and, and, and additional employees. And so there, you know, I think that there is this notion of like the engineer is founder, um, but, you know, the teams that are inside startups have you know, more diverse skills mm -hmm. and that kind of a thing. And, you know, psychology is a great background for that, as well as things like, um, you know, user interface and, and, and that sort of a, other disciplines that exist within startups. So I think that it's important to be doing something that you are really passionate about and work really hard at. And, you know, I think there, there are a myriad of roles at startups that need these different sorts of skills that, that really make a huge difference in, in how, they, how they build companies. Great, thank you both so much. I appreciated it from both of you guys. I'll try to have bounce sides, so. Hello, hello, okay there. Hi, uh, my name is Alfredo. Um, I'm a business major. I had a simple question. It might be a little personal, but I mean, it's something that I look at or I look into when I try to see like the stories of people that became you know, prosperous and famous in the future. Did you ever like, when you were trying to figure out what you were doing, did you ever go through a depression or anything hard that you were facing that brought you really down and how did you get out of it? Because I personally like to look at stories because I know that once I go through it, I wanna look at how other people did it to get myself out of it if I ever do. So I will say two things. I will say one thing which is, um, if you can find someone to share your life with, whom you love as and, and admire and respect, that makes a huge difference. That there's been a difference for me. The other thing, though, that I that I thought, and I'm like grateful beyond words for that. Um, I, I could talk more about that, but uh, <laughs> beyond be words. That'd be nice. Um, so, and I don't know if this is exactly. You certainly have had ups, certainly had downs, and it, at you know at, at danger. Um, I shared an office for most of the time with a, a co-founder. And, you know, that camaraderie, I mean, it's a little bit different, obviously, but that was really important. But they were like, ah, today feels like we're going to, out of, going to go out of business kind of day. Like, just nothing is going right and stuff like that. And had these really trying times. Um, and part of what I would sometimes think about is, like, what's the worst case scenario? You know, like I said, you didn't have kids at the time, you know, married, you know, very much in love and that sort of thing. And, you know, I, I didn't feel like my wife was going to divorce me if the company failed. Um, you know, so, like, I, I would sort of think, like, if you can feel like the worst case outcome is you're still going to be okay. And in a startup, if the startup fails, it's still going to be okay. And so when I could realize, like, okay, well, the worst case scenario, it's going to be okay, then, like, okay, well, it, from here on, it's just upside, right? And so, you know, you, you, you all are young, you have your whole life ahead of you, smart and hardworking and all these other kinds of things. If you have a failure, it's okay. And so obviously the people, and you know, my heart goes out to them, who have you know, depression and, and, and much more difficult things to, to work with, and I think there's all kinds of help available, and, and one should have, you know, certainly reach out to the resources that exist on campus and, and as you're out in the world. But the, the, I would always try to think about, like, well, if the worst case is going to be all right, and I've come to peace. Okay, now let's just let's just see what we can do. So I would say those kind of two things. I would say Have someone has, you love. He has this attitude, and it drives me crazy. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, it's a great question, Alfredo, and actually all of us. That I mean, I, I'm still working, so I think you 
have failures all the time, and I'm also very passionate. So the same way I'm very, very happy, I can get very, very sad. Um, and I think probably the worst time, um, you know, my first company, uh, at a, lo a long time ago, and you know, my kids would say the last century in 1999. You know, when you started a company and you were an engineer, and a female engineer, it was like the double whammy. Um, they would say, "Well, we need to bring a CEO, right?" And that's kind of the thing that companies did. It has changed; it's no longer the case. Uh, but at the time, that was the expectation, right? So, in my first company. Um, uh, they, you know, the mo they, they, you know, they handed me the first check, and at the same time started a CEO search. Uh, and at the end, the CEO ended up, you know, I was, you know, the CEO doesn't like to have a second person judging them. So um, I was let go of that company, and I think that was my identity. My identity was having started that company. It was like, it was, you know, I had no life. I think. You know, we, we, we had a home with no furniture. It was just it was nothing because we had no time to do anything. It was just, um, you know, working on that company. So, um, you know, I think I went on a trip or something. It's almost like the most important is to just accept, 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 and then move on, right? Uh, but I, it was really tough for me. For sure, it was really tough. And, you know, my founders, you know, I've seen a hundred times an employee leave or a customer not closing. But I have to remember that for every founder I work with, it's the first time that it happens to them. And for them, it's a huge deal. So my job is to say, OK, it's a huge deal. I have to empathize. Uh, now I'm going to tell you everything I know on how we're going to solve it, right? Or how are we going to address it? Uh, but it takes you know, to live that several times to get good at that. So it's not something you're naturally born with. like. Bad things happen, no problem. You know, that's actually not easy. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I was asking because I wanted to give a story. But I don't know if I'm allowed to, am I? All right, so let me tell you a little bit about my background. I come from the middle of nowhere. I live nine hours from here, um, Calexico, California, uh, next to the border of Mexicali, Mexico. And my story of how I got into Berkeley was ever since the sixth grade, I've known what I wanted to do with my life. I want to open a company on holographic technology. So I was planning to go to MIT, stuff happened uh, my senior year. I hated depression. I just didn't even apply because I, I knew I wasn't going to make it. So I was just going along with after that, like, all right, well, what do I do now? I'm applying to the UCs like everybody else as a backup option. Me and my group of friends, we're a group of four, um, we all applied. Most of them got rejected. The first one they got into, like the one they all got into was Berkeley. I was rejected. I was the only one that was rejected out of the group. So of course, the depression hit harder. What am I gonna do now? My friends just like, being as supportive as they were, they were like, you know what? Work your, well, work your, your, your ass off. In the next two years at community college and meet us back at Berkeley. We'll live together, we'll figure it out and we'll start the company or something. Um, I kept my promise. I worked my ass off two years later, now I'm in Haas. I didn't know anything about Haas at the time because since it's a small, small city. Um, it's more work-based. I worked six jobs in the last year, um, did whatever I could to help my mother, you know, support three kids and stuff. But on the side, I like gave all my time I could into college to pass with straight A's. I passed with the 4.0 at the top of my class. But yeah, I mean, like you said, yeah, sometimes you just need somebody to share your life with and stuff like that. And well, I have a really supportive friend group and well, here I am now a business major and they're all EECS majors. So we're trying to figure okay. ourselves out. Job. But yeah. Uh, yeah, just a quick question. So I mentioned both of you mentioned, or I remember both of you mentioned that you know starting up is very much a people-focused business. So you know, both of you being VCs, I was hoping to ask what specifically do you look for when investing in a co-founding team? Um, I remember Peter Thiel mentioned that oftentimes sameness um, can help when building something quick. Um, but I also men remember you uh, mentioning that diversity in skills and thoughts is also important. I um, was generally hoping to ask what specific things, uh, if you have like any specific things do you look at? Well, I like, the te I like teams that complement each other. If you have two people that do the same 
and um, know the same and have the same role, it's a recipe for conflict in the long run, right? If there's two great engineers, software engineers, there's always a point in the company where it's like, where, where, you know, when the company's larger, which one are you, where do you go? It's just harder. I like teams where everybody has a clear responsibility. You're in charge of shipping the product, you're in charge of um, raising money, you're in charge of this. And when people have clear knowledge of what they're in charge of, they, they feel empowered to do their best. So that's what I like in terms of should you be equal or separate or different. Does it mean that we don't invest in companies where you have two people that are fairly similar? No, we, we will still do it. But, you know, it's better if, when, you know, you cover a lot. I, I call it the minimum viable team. What is your minimum viable team to get to the next stage, right? And if that's part of the DNA of the company, and the DNA of the company is the founding team, you're a stronger company. So that's the way I look at it um, in terms of being zip same or different. I don't know what you do. Yeah, so I, I think those are all excellent points. I mean, I think another thing is also sort of how to, like, interpersonally, how do people get along, you know, and conflict will be inevitable. Do you have ways of, you know, so we look at teams when we consider how they work together, and even things as, like, simple as how do they pitch together, you know, is there a rapport between the founding team, and, and it, it, it shines through pretty quickly when you ask a question and, you know, if one of them doesn't like the answer and they talk over each other and stuff like that, you have to get along with people. So I, I think that sort of stuff is really important. So to be complementary both in skills and then also to make sure that, you know, because you're probably going to go through some pretty tough times if you're part of a founding team. And so to make sure that there are people that you would want to do that with and that you can, you can collaborate effectively in good times and bad. Hi, I'm Anmol. I'm an EECS and industrial engineering major. I had a question for you specifically. You mentioned that you've invested in minus one, where a person had a wrong idea, but you knew it was the right person. Could you elaborate more on that? Uh, sure, I have many of them. So uh, one of my first companies is a company called Branch, and I met them, when I met them, I met them in office hours and at Stanford, so I do a lot of free office hours. So um, Alex, the CEO, pitched me the company that he was working on, and it, he was building a mobile app where you could select a group of pictures, and it would print a photo album, and it would ship it to your home. Um, the way he was explaining this, and he was running this company, and the way he had built his team, I was just really, really impressed. I remember running back to our, you know, to our home, back to the home where we worked out of with Peshman, and I said, you know, we have to back this person. It doesn't matter. This company will not be a big company, but he's going to figure something out. And they went through two pivots before they ended up doing what they do today. They're a deep linking company and search company. And, um, you know, I think by the third pivot, they came to see us and said, oh, you know, we want to return your money, you know, but we have a new idea, but I, you know, it's like the third time. And um, the four founders came at once. So when the four people show up, it's bad news. <laughs> you know? So um, we're like, no, no, just keep it. We, but we believe in you. So, you know, this company now is a uh, $4 billion or I don't even know, like some multiple billion dollar company, but um, it was definitely a, a minus one moment. We, we run an accelerator and I think more than 50 percent of the companies will change what they do in the process. It's probably higher, you know, I, I don't know the number exactly, but it's just part of the business of starting a company. It's again, recognizing that maybe what you're working on is not quite right or it's not exactly right and I need to change, right? And if you're okay, what I tell people at the beginning is just about exercising that muscle very fast um, and being comfortable with it. So, you know, we look for people that are able to do that. And if you're able to have a hypothesis and sound reasonable presenting it, um, then you're probably going to do it again. So that's what I look for. Uh, 
Uh, hello, I'm Vitos. I study philosophy. And I wanted to ask, um, you said that it is important to want success more than others. And I wanted to ask what like the root of that feeling was for the two of you. So why did you want it more than others? Um, yeah. It's a good question. You know, I, um, you know I'm an, I came from Spain, I'm an immigrant, and I think when I first came to the US, um, I was just so impressed, to be honest, because I, you know, in, my, in my undergraduate, I had a computer that we shared with, I think, like 25 people. And when I came to Stanford, they gave me my own computer. So it was just, for me, it was just a big shock to come here and see what, you know, it had. So I always felt that I was from an underdog position. Even I think the first, my first week at Stanford, um, I, my first day, um, I went to my research group and they showed me, you know, I was so, um, you know, I felt really like, oh my gosh, I don't belong here. I went to this research room and they showed me this, uh, some grad student was showing these chips that would move. It had microfluidics and it made them move. And I remember coming home and telling Matt, oh my God, I like, I must quit. This is just not the right place for me. So I think from that point, I've always felt the underdog and I always felt like I had to do more to win, um, which is a good position to be in, I think. Even today, so. So I, I think what what we really like to see in founders, and I think that what sort of powered danger in terms of the, the founder's vision, and honestly, like all the employees who came for a very long time, is that you imagine the world as it is, and you want to change the world to have your company you know, shipping, right? So, um, you know, founders will have, like I said, this silicon photonics-based quantum computing company. I mean, the founders there, it's obviously like deep technology, I mean, it's very technical, but they want to have that thing exist, right? And they're going to work very, very hard to make that happen. Or, you know, these synthetic biology, you know, therapeutic platform companies, just that people have this drive that I want to turn my imagination into reality. And so I, I think that that's, that's really the founding, the, the, the founder's drive is towards that. Like there's the world without, you know, my product shipping, and I want the world with my product shipping, and just to have that, that kind of drive to, to make that happen. Well, I think that there's many questions on that question, so I'll try to go to what, maybe the last one. Um, I mean, you, you will graduate with a Berkeley degree, and if you go to a startup or you start a company and your first company fails, you still have a Berkeley degree, so you'll be able to get a job, right? So I think the risk of uh, going to a startup and you know, destroying your life is actually very, very low, right? Um, the, there's a question also always about can I afford it, right? Some people can actually, uh, will work for a year or two, save money and use that money to kind of bootstrap the company and so on. And that's obviously very viable. You have to, you know, be able to um, have enough money around the table to, to eat and sleep, right? So uh, it depends on a personal, you know, personally of where you are in your life as to when you can take that economic short-term risk. But professionally, there's no risk. I would say there's a risk of not doing it because once you get old, it's very, very hard to do, you know, to go to a startup. Very hard. You know, you're accustomed, you have kids, you have a mortgage, you have whatever. Your life is too complicated. But at the beginning, uh, you're, you know, you're, it's, it's really, you're fresh, you know, you have all these ideas. It's, 
it's, it's not a risky thing to do a startup, especially if you have a Berkeley degree, like I said. Um, so thank you guys for being here. Um, the question I have uh, for you guys is, you know, in this world where there is always a constant influx of ideas, um, as investors, how do you guys differentiate sound from noise and, you know, genuinely revolutionary ideas from fads? Well, we, we hear lots and lots of pitches, and I think that the question that we sort of ask is, you know, what's, I, I described the world today and then the world when your company you know, ships its, its product, you know, we're, we're trying to imagine how much of a difference will that make. And so I think that the thing that we usually, the, the difference between something that gets us really excited and something which we think you know, is, is, is maybe interesting and we respect that the founder or the founding team wants to build it, but where we think it's, it's not as, you know, we're, we're unlikely to invest, is largely around the scale of the problem that they're solving. Um, and so I think that we get really excited when we think that there's differentiation in the technology. So yeah, that is, there, there is a lot of technology there. It's not sort yeah, of superficial. Minutes, mm -hmm. um, and where we think, okay, there, that could be, you know, there, there are a lot of potential customers. There's a, a big market for this. So technical differentiation and the size of the market, you know, as well as the, the, the quality of the team. I mean, that, those are sort of the three things that have to come together usually. I will say something because I think, you know, if you want to, there's different businesses. You don't have to have a venture business to have a, you know, a happy, successful life, right? There's a lot of people that don't have venture businesses. If you want to have a venture business, then you must play in a big market, right? You have to go after a big market because otherwise the numbers don't make sense for investors. So what is a big market? Um, it's actually very simple is you, you think of how many people you can sell your product to, and then you do this math. The price I can charge times the number of people equals some number that has to be, you know, I it used to be a billion, but now the funds are so big that you probably want to hit something more like five or 10, right? Um, so I think it's important, you know, many of you may be psychologists, environmentalists, um, engineers, whatever, different professions. Anybody can be an expert in mar a market. It just requires to want to learn the market. And that's one of the things I've learned the hard way. But if you want to be an expert in any market, go read about it, you know. And you can read uh, the S1s of all the public companies in that sector. They tell you all the story. You understand what it is. So when a, a, a founder comes to us and they have at least that market curiosity, they, it doesn't have to be completely right, but they have some of that, um, you know, it makes us you know, very happy because we know that they have it in them that they're going to go figure it out, right? And it's very basic. I think sometimes people are afraid, oh, I need a business guy or a sales guy or whatever. Um, I think I really believe in the potential of everybody to learn it. And Thank you. Also, uh, I want to make sure that you potentially can make your flight tonight. <laughs> uh, I want to also thank you. Um, it wasn't just serendipitous that we asked the two of you all to talk at the beginning, um, because not only are you both incredibly accomplished, but I find you really different. We and, are very different. Yeah, and I figure <laughs> if you all can get up here and, and so graciously talk, it's, it'll be inspirational for the students, and it has been. Um, I want to thank you very much. If there may be a few minutes, I know not everybody got to ask a question, but if you can, if you want to ask quickly afterwards, um, hopefully you'll be able to say, yeah, we have to go. Uh, but thank you all for all your questions, and most of all, thank you for your generous time with us today. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you. So you all can kind of, if you want to come up to the stage and ask Mar and, uh, or Matt anything, come on and do that. <laughs>